Okay, uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, who is joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Multi-Cluster Surface Mesh Operations and Extensibility with WebAssembly. Uh, my name is Ariel Jatib. I'm a CNCF ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar uh, and would like to welcome our presenters today. Uh, Edith Levine, uh, founder and CEO at Solo.io, and Christian Posta, uh, global field CTO at Solo.io. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we get started. During the webinar, uh, you're not going to be able to talk as an attendee. Uh, there is a Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions in there, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the talk. Um, a reminder, this is an official CNCF webinar, and as such, subject to the CNCF's code of conduct. Uh, please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the code of conduct. Uh, basically, just please be respectful to all your fellow participants and the presenters. Um, please also note that the recording and uh, slides of this talk uh, will be available later today um, at the CNCF webinar page, uh, www.cncf.io forward slash webinars. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Edith and uh, Christian to kick off today's presentation. All right, thank you very much, Ariel. This is a pleasure to be here. And as Ariel mentioned, the title is you know, on, on the screen and we'll talk about service mesh and multi-cluster operations around service mesh. And then some of the challenges that you'll, you'll run into when when going down that path. And then, you know, as you adopt this type of technology, there's never a 100% fit. So there's, there's going to be need for extensibility and extending the capabilities of the service mesh and, and this type of infrastructure. And so we'll look at how WebAssembly is emerging as the, the technology to be able to do that. So I'll start leading and then we'll hear from Adit when we get to the, the WebAssembly parts. So as organizations are moving down the Kubernetes path and, and microservice path, so they need to solve for service to service communication challenges and doing that across different programming languages and different frameworks becomes operationally very intense. So you might have specific libraries and frameworks to be able to do that for each language and per permutation of framework and so forth. And trying to keep that all consistent, keep that in sync across all the different services um, is, is, is kind of a, like I said, is, a, is, a, is painful. And so that's where the, the service mesh pattern and the, the technology that has sprung up around this pattern this is where that, that technology fits. And we think it's the right pattern and the right technology. And what we've seen working with our customers and prospects and others in the community is that it is real. It's here to stay, it's real. People are adopting it, people are putting it in production, people are becoming successful with it. And with this service mesh pattern, what we're effectively saying is abstract out the application networking code, the stuff that deals with things like timeouts and retries, circuit breaking, um, telemetry collection, client side load balancing, and on and on, right? These are not unique to any one particular language or application or framework or any of this. So let's abstract that out and model that as a, an interceptor for your applications. So that your applications, when they talk to the network, they will go through this interceptor that applies and enriches the network communication with, with these types of behavior and makes your network communication more secure, observable, and, and resilient. So that's where in a very quick two minute explanation where the service mesh fits into, into place. But like I said, these organizations are different they have varying levels of existing, let's say, um, uh, investment in their applications and their protocols and their processes and so forth. And fitting in with the, in their specific regulations, being compliant, 
being backward compatible and so forth, this increases the burden on the operator of the system as well as an, you know, increases the need for extending and, and um, customizing the, the, you know, this, this interceptor, this service mesh. Now, if you've been following the CNCF, you know that Envoy is a top level uh, graduated project at the CNCF and has been for some time. And Envoy in the practical implementations of a mesh becomes that interceptor, becomes the magic through which the network communication travels. Right, so, so Envoy is where th we can implement things like client side load balancing, service discovery, timeouts, retry circuit breaking, retry budgets, this type of stuff, as well as things like telemetry collection about what's happening across the network, across the various different services that we're communicating with things like rate limiting and uh, we can enforce security expectations at, at the Envoy proxy. And deployed in practice, Envoy is, is deployed alongside the application. So that in this type of architecture, again, it doesn't matter what language or framework that you're using, but the all, all communication going out over the network happens through Envoy. And you can see in this diagram, if it's deployed one-to-one -one with our application, we start to form this mesh, this idea of the mesh and, and the service mesh builds on this and controls things like the transport. So we can do things like uh, TLS encryption or mutual TLS. Uh, we can do things like collecting very fine grain uh, telemetry Things like um, you know, the number of requests per second that are going through the channel, the number of requests that are failing, um, retry attempts, and, and so forth. So we can get a very detailed and high fidelity uh, understanding of what's happening on the network just by having Envoy in, in the path here. Now, when you start to deploy Envoy at scale, and deploy that in a, you know, across a hybrid, all these different types of applications and, and so forth. You need a, a way of driving the configuration in a way that's consistent with this, this cluster, this environment and the, and the configuration um, that, you're, that you're trying to apply. So this is where the service mesh concept comes in where you have this idea of the proxies or the interceptors in, in with the application that form the data plane, and then some controlling mechanism, some interface or way that allows operators, developers, SREs, so forth, automation, you know, process automation around this to drive the behavior of the data plane and the control plane mediates that by providing the API and communicating directly with the, the data plane. Now, in the case of deploying Envoy at scale, there's quite a few different control planes that you can leverage to accomplish that. Istio is one that's been around for a while that um, provides a control plane for these Envoy proxies. But we also see other um, entrants into this, uh, into this space, like Kuma from the folks at Kong, like Consul has been enhanced to support service mesh capabilities and uh, especially around uh, the, being a control plane for Envoy, as well as managed services like those built into some of the uh, uh, cloud providers. So you, you'll see uh, AWS App Mesh, for example, from AWS, things like Traffic Director from Google and, and, and so forth. And we're, and we're probably going to see more of these different control planes that take slightly different approaches for building their experience with the operator. Um, and these can be used to, to drive the behavior of, of the service mesh. Now, because of this kind of emerging different approaches for driving the behavior of a service mesh, adopters and, and new users coming into this 
might see this as uh, confusing. And with these different control planes and different assumptions with the, and, and differing APIs, um, how do they know which one to choose? If they choose one, will it be the winning one? Or is it too complicated and too low level for what they're trying to do? Uh, does it have and expose all of the features or, or at least the ones that you need from the underlying data plane? And in Envoy's case, Envoy is incredibly feature rich and the control planes being as an abstraction would, would expose those capabilities, but not all of them expose every, you know, a consistent uh, set of those capabilities. And the APIs are highly different. And that's important because what the service mesh is ultimately affording you is a way to automate the behavior of the network. And if you're going to automate and control and observe the network, any of the, the automation you build on top of it will be then tied to that particular API for that, that mesh. And at, at Solo specifically, we've, we've been very interested in this problem, kind of the, where the theoretical meets the practical and how organizations are adopting this type of technology. And back in 2018, we launched an open source project called Superglue that aimed to specifically solve this, this problem. And then about six months later, May 2019, we partnered with Microsoft and HashiCorp and Buoyant and a few others to drive this, um, th this idea of a unifying API on top of these different uh, meshes. Uh, and, and do that in the open, do that as a, as, a, as a spec. And so that's where the service mesh interface spec, which is now part of the CNCF, um, that's, that's where that originated. And the idea with this is the underlying technology for the most part, not always, but for the most part um, is, is Envoy based. So there's a common API there. Now, how you expose that to your, to your operators and users of the system will likely eventually converge in some way. Um, and what we would like to do is see a unifying abstraction that doesn't tie you to any one particular provider, especially in this current state of, um, you, know, you know, things are changing, right? Uh, the volatility of, of uh, these different products and so forth. So service mesh interface is a simplified abstraction on top of various different service mesh APIs on, on which you can then deploy your, your automation. Now that's, that's, that's good. So now we have a, a starting point to kind of treat these different service meshes. But the reality is when you start deploying a, a, a new set of infrastructure, you need it to be highly available. You need it to be able to scale, you need it to fit within compliance and other regulatory concerns. And in general, the practice around deploying containers and building fault domains for those applications tends to go toward building more clusters and, and, and some of these smaller clusters versus deploying everything into a single cluster and expecting it to be multi-tenant and, you know, establish the failure domains and fault planes that you, that you need. Um, when in case in, in, in practice, that's kind of difficult, very difficult. And so some of the patterns that we see when talking about building this, this mesh across multiple different clusters and, and continuing to establish these different fault domains, we see one that might look like, well, let's just assume we have a flat network and the communication, everything is addressable between those clusters and the, the services talk directly to each other. Now, this is, although this is an approach to going in the direction of, of a multi-cluster system, it still merges together the, the idea of, of these fault planes, right? So if you, if you have two different clusters, if you're sharing the same, control plane and you have the expectation for flat networking, if that one control plane goes down, then both clusters effectively go down. 
right? So you're not getting the level of isolation that, that you might be looking for, but it is a step toward, all right, utilizing the compute across two different clusters. Another approach is not assuming that these are flat networks, assuming that they might be different networks, and still using a single control plane to manage the Envoy proxies and, and the mesh at, at whole, <clears throat> excuse me, through, uh, through gateways that play the role of bridging the different networks. Um, Istio is an example of a service mesh that supports this type of shared control plane across separate networks and then uses Envoy features like locality weighted load balancing. So when a, a service, let's say the account service tries to talk with the user service, if that service is no longer available, then you know, the Envoy will be smart enough as programmed by the control plane to be able to route across into the second cluster. And then lastly, a, a pattern that um, is probably most, um, most desirable in terms of isolation is running separate control planes in these different clusters. So in this model, you do have uh, more autonomy, more isolation, and um, you know, your services still kind of mimic the, the, what we saw in the previous uh, um, patterns where the networks might have been flat or you know, there might be a shared control plane. And in this, in this model, the, the control planes try to mimic that, uh, that environment, which isn't, isn't the case. Now you have better isolation, you have separate networks and, and so forth. The only downside to this is that it significantly increases the burden of the operator of this mesh to do things like, well, make sure that, you know, for, for identity reasons, that the certificates that are used for TLS and, and mutual TLS, they all come from the same root. Uh, things like service discovery. When, we, when, when the account service tries to talk to user, how does it know that there's also a user service in cluster two and to use that for failover. Um, and you know, other, other routing and configuration concerns that take into account being multi-cluster. So these are things that the operator is going to have to build automation around and, and um, you know, continue to keep that up and maintain that uh, throughout the life of this architecture. So we see things that I started touching on, things like service discovery and federation of the services across these different uh, control planes. Because they are isolated, they need to be treated independently. Um, so you need some automation for that. Things like failover, how are you specifying that indeed when or if the user service fails, that we fail over to cluster two and not cluster three or four, which may be farther away or in different regions or more expensive or, or whatever. Right, so you need you need some uh, smarts and and maintain that uh, that ability to specify the failover configuration. Things like when you make changes, now if you make changes to the system, you want to introduce new routing rules or whatever, you need to make sure that those are valid and that they're consistent consistent in terms of the overall system. Um, so and, and version upgrades. So there's a there's a lot of operational overhead of managing this type of environment that um, you know, is, is, is a significant downside to, to trying to build a, a multi-cluster service mesh solution. So the problems don't stop there, unfortunately. Um, you might think of this as a, well, let's just deploy this all into Kubernetes and use our service mesh of, of choice and then you realize, well, maybe a certain particular mesh doesn't run in Kubernetes and you have to run it outside and maybe in VMs, or there's a mesh available to you in your public cloud and you wanna leverage that because it's significantly cheaper than trying to run it yourself. And then you run into problems of, well, now you run the control plane in all these different environments. You can't treat them all exactly the same. Now your automation has become even more complex. And so at, 
at Solo, what we're working on is open source tooling to be able to solve this problem and reduce the operational burden placed on users of a system like this so that you can be successful with Envoy based technology, service mesh uh, based technology. And, you know, it, it lives harmoniously with other projects that are, that are, that are working in this, in this space to, to also simplify and, and reduce the volatility, things like service mesh uh, interface and so forth. So this management plane becomes an important component to driving the control planes in these various different footprints, taking care of automating things like the service discovery information or the, um, the, the identity, uh, dri deriving the identity from a, a root source and automating that, those components. Uh, things like validating the configuration across these different uh, footprints and treating routing and access policy configuration in terms of multi-cluster and in terms of being consistent across these, these multiple clusters. And so that's where a, our, our open source project here, Service Mesh Hub fits into the, the picture. Service Mesh Hub is intended to be able to solve these problems for various service mesh implementations, regardless of what that that implementation is. So we support things like, uh, like Istio and App Mesh and, uh, you know, we're, it's, it's very pluggable in, in such a way that you can add additional mesh implementations. And the idea with it is to allow you to first identify what your current state is so we can discover your existing mesh infrastructure. And when we, when we discover that across, let's say, multiple clusters, we can build a single unified global view of what are the workloads, where do they run, and then start incrementally adding capabilities like service discovery and unifying the trust domains and automating um, configuration generation and that, and that kind of stuff across the, the cluster. And so Service Mesh Hub is, like I said, an open source project. And basically its architecture looks something like this, where you have the management plane that a, a user and operator um, interacts with. And from there drives the behavior of any mesh specific individual control planes. In this particular example, we have Istio running in two different clusters and use the Service Mesh Hub management plane to, uh, to configure it. Now this might be a good time to go from the theoretical discussion to an actual demo. And let's see if I can pull this off. So let's first of all, make sure that we're on the right cluster. All right. Now, the first thing we want to do is let's take a look at our, at our cluster, our clusters. We have two clusters. They are both running an Istio control plane as depicted in this diagram here. We also have the Istio book info demo running. So on, these, on the bottom panes, you can see in cluster one, we have the book info demo running. We have an Istio sidecar deployed next to those components, which is, which is Envoy under the covers. And we see that in cluster two, that we have um, other components related to the book info demo that are running in a second cluster. So that second cluster also has Istio running. You can see the sidecar Envoy's deployed there. If we come to our, oh, shouldn't see errors. No, All right. So if we come here and refresh a couple times, what we should see is the book info demo as expected. On the right hand side, we'll see that it's load balancing. We'll see a couple of different uh, types of reviews. We see reviews with stars and reviews without stars. And what's happening is all the traffic is going into cluster one on the left hand side. You can see here where we have reviews v1, oh, what? 
Uh, sorry about that. We have reviews v1 and reviews v2 running in cluster one. And then in, uh, in cluster two, we see reviews v3. All right, and what we're gonna do in this demo is use Service Mesh Hub, unify these different service meshes into a single logical virtual mesh so that these, so that the book info demo can now route across the clusters to different versions of reviews in a very transparent, very easy way. First thing we wanna do is let's install Service Mesh Hub. Service Mesh Hub comes with a helper CLI this can also be done with Helm, but a helper CLI that uh, allows us to quickly install the, the components, the control plane or, or management plane components for Service Mesh Hub. When we do that, let's actually take a look at the networking and discovery components that make up Service Mesh Hub and those seem to be up and running. Next, let's run a check and cross our fingers here. Okay, this is a live demo. So the check here validates that there are, you know, the, the, any minimum requirements are met, that the components are installed correctly, and that there are no errors. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna register our two clusters, cluster one and cluster two with Service Mesh Hub. And then we're gonna see what, what are some of the discovery capabilities? What are some of the uh, federation and multi-cluster management capabilities that we get by uh, using Service Mesh Hub? So we'll register cluster one, which we're doing here. And then we'll do the same thing for cluster two. And under the covers, what this is doing is just, it's giving us access to those, those different clusters so that we can discover the different components, uh, both control plane and data plane components that are running to make a determination of what type of mesh, if a mesh is running, what, what type of mesh exists there. So let's use kubectl to get a CR, a custom resource called Kubernetes clusters. So when we registered these clusters, um, the Mesh CTL tool or Service Mesh Hub created these different entries so we know to what clusters we are connected or, or could be connected to. The next thing we want to do is use kubectl to get the meshes, another CR, another custom resource, that if Service Mesh Hub has identified different meshes running in these clusters that will create a, a, a mesh as well. And we can see that we have uh, two of these meshes that have been discovered. Now let's group these two meshes so that we can automate things like service discovery, identity, a root domain, and, and so forth. We're gonna do that with this virtual mesh CR. This virtual mesh allows us to specify the federation mode, the identity mode, as well as if we're gonna do a, a shared root identity where to derive that root. In this case, we'll, we'll create it, but you can also plug in an, an existing root CA. And now let's apply this and we should see the service mesh hub. It's, it, it, it observes this new virtual mesh CR and we'll start making things happen. So let's take a look at the mesh now, the, the virtual mesh we should see that the status is reported as being accepted. So that's a good sign. And now uh, what we, we do wanna do is give it a second to, um, so what happens under the covers is the root, the root uh, CAs are unified. The service entries in this case, Istio's service entries are created on both clusters to be enable service discovery and load balancing and that type of thing. And from there, what we've, what we've now unified them to be a, a single mesh, what we can do is apply configuration to things like access control and traffic routing 
so that we can treat these two different clusters, two different meshes effectively as a single mesh. So let's look at, um, first of all, the, the service discovery components. Uh, we can see that those were automatically created. In this case, we're looking in cluster one. Uh, all of the entries were created so that we can talk to services in cluster two. If we look on cluster two itself, we can see the reverse has happened. So from cluster two, we can talk to cluster one. And these service entries have been created. And now if we create a traffic policy that is cluster aware, that specifies that traffic should be going to cluster two, like a, a three quarters of the traffic should be going to cluster two, while the rest of it you know, gets routed to, to cluster one, then we should see some behavior changes in our book info application. So let's apply that. And actually, if we look under the covers and see what that created, if we look at the virtual services that were created, so this is an actually Istio virtual service, by applying this traffic policy, Service Mesh Hub went out to the different service meshes and different clusters and created the appropriate cluster aware virtual services. So we see that, that here. Now, if we come back to our demo, if I refresh, we should see, um, we should see, routing go over to the second cluster, maybe. Actually, you know what, sometimes the, yep. Sometimes the port forwarding doesn't cooperate. Come here, refresh. You should see, let's refresh a couple times. There we go. So the red stars is actually reviews version three. And if we refresh a few times, actually we should see 75% of the traffic going to the red stars, which now we, Refresh a few more times that we actually see that happening. The last thing, when you start building and, and managing these routing rules across multiple clusters between different services, it becomes, it can become difficult to reason about any one particular service. So the service mesh hub, like I said, builds this unified view of, of the entire sets of clusters here and can give you exactly what are the rules using this describe command, um, kind of zeroing in on a particular service and, and giving you all the rules that might apply or in some cases where they might uh, uh, un unexpectedly conflict. A service mesh hub, we're trying to prevent those conflicts and we can give you kind of simulations of con configuration um, as, as they get applied and validation of it and so forth. But with the describe command, we can see in real time what that looks like. So that's, I, I covered the part of getting from a service mesh to a realistic deployment, um, building for different uh, multi-cluster topologies and scenarios, the operational burden that, that, incur, that you incur for doing that and how service mesh hub can simplify that. But service mesh hub also kind of plays in the picture of what Edith is going to talk about next, because what we want to do is, is provide a holistic experience for people adopting Envoy and service mesh based technology. And a big part of that is getting it to fit 100% in your environment and in your constraints, not just, you know, 90%, right? So you need that last 10% 10, 10 integration and, and extensibility. Um, and that is where Edith will take over. Thanks so much, uh, Christian. So awesome, guys. So let me, I will try to speed it up because I don't think we have enough time and we really, really want to show you a demo. So in the nutshell, as Christian mentioned, we are, move, we are using Envoy in production for a long, long time. Over three years, we have a lot of customers running Envoy in production. And one of the, 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 uh, the big functionality for Envoy, why we chose actually to focus on it, is the fact that you can actually customize that. So what does it mean, right? As Christian said, every customer has their own environment and usually they need to tweak a little bit the way the proxy is working in order to adjust it specifically to all their 100% fit to their environment. So Envoy doing it, you know, big kind of like shout out to Matt Klein here who, who designed it brilliantly. One thing that Envoy has the ability is to give you the ability to actually um, customize that. How is that working? So when a request is actually coming to the proxy itself, it's going for something it's called um, 
filter chain. So basically the request itself is going through a piece of code, we're calling it filter, that it actually can give functionality and then move it to the next filter. That way you can actually uh, customize every request that's coming, what is exactly the thing you want to do with this, right? And a very kind of like common example is what I have here, which is an external hot usually, right? You want to know the, who is the people that's talking and how they actually, you know, if the request is actually um, a secure to move to the backend server, you know, rate limiting is a great example and so on and so on. The, again, the brilliant of Envoy is the fact that you can actually wrote your own custom filter. So you have the, rail, the, the chain, but you can actually customize the order of the chain as well as the actually coded running in chain. So a lot of the stuff that we're doing in Solo, for instance, all this time is basically building those kind of filters for our customers, right? We have a lot of finance industry. So we, for instance, are going to supply them something like OpenID Connect uh, support, uh, data loss prevention, WAF based on mode security, maybe transformation between uh, REST to SOL and so on. So, so this is giving you a lot, a lot of fun, but it's also extremely complex because each of those filter actually written in C++ async, which means that if you want to actually modify the custom, you create your own custom filter, you have to actually apply this in C++ async. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of libraries that kind of like available. That means that a lot of the stuff, if you want to talk to something like Kafka, for instance, we actually need to step down and write in C++ all those libraries, which is extremely, extremely hard. Now, that's not end. So let's assume that I, you know, that, that you write your C++ um, a filter. Now what you need to do, you need to actually recompile Envoy to know to basically include it. And recompile Envoy is by itself an interesting uh, scenario. I can tell you personally that in my company, every time that someone joined the company and is getting that assignment to actually uh, compile Envoy, we using some, you know all the community using something called Basel, and it's just extremely hard. So all this process of actually customized to whatever you want, it's actually pretty pretty um, complex, and therefore you know not not really trivial. A lot of the people kind of like will defer it to someone like us. Uh, Kristen, can you move? Okay, so. As a community, we're sitting together and we try to figure out what will be the actual way to fix this. And Google actually came with this idea of what if we will take WebAssembly and we will leverage to this functionality. So what make WebAssembly, first of all, what is WebAssembly? And second of all, why it's make it so useful for technology offense. So the first thing, let's start by saying that actually WebAssembly, it's no assembly, right? And it's actually not only for the web, so it's kind of like a strange name. Uh, it's not assembly because it's actually very, it's a binary structure format. So it's really close to that, but it's not actually a, a, a web assembly. It's not actually assembly. The other thing is that it's not, you know, by using a new uh, interface that, they, that, they, that the standard announced that called WASI, it's actually also does not have to be for the web. You can actually take it out. But the reason they actually build it in, in kind of like the first initiative purpose of web assembly was for the browser. So they really wanted to give an ability to have a code that's run in the browser, but it have to be a very portable because you know we have a lot of you know system that the browser running on. It have to be secure. So if something happened in this model, I want to make sure that it's not taking all my browser down. It have to be fast, and right this is this is why the binary uh, instruction format will help you because it's way more close to assembly code than actually something like JavaScript. And most important is I want to allow people to write it in any language. I don't want to limit them only to a specific one. So this is why it was really, really important to kind of like to the browser system. And when Google saw it, they said, this is brilliant. We can actually take it because a lot of that functionality will help us a lot if we will embed it in Envoy. So again, port portability may be less, but you know, secure definitely. We want to make sure that it's secure, fast, always important, specifically because it's on the request part, part. So it's really, really important that it will be, you know, uh, pretty fast. You don't want to start the, the user, you know, waiting for the request, for a response. And any language is just really powerful, right? I mean, C++, I think it's pretty challenging. And I want to make sure that all of us will be able to write it. So this is why we, you know, uh, Google kind of like came with this. We also did it's awesome. And we decided to uh, kind of like integrated WebAssembly into Envoy functionality. Next, Christine. Okay. 
So how something like this is working? So the first thing that we need to do, we need to write a filter, right, in the nutshells. And this filter right now, this custom filter, what we basically did is we basically uh, teach it how the interface of the filter will be able to, to, to basically assemble, let's say, or, or match to a functions, the interface basically that, the, you know, the function that you can apply on your a web assembly model, right? So in the nutshell, if you think about it, but it's, it's, it's kind of like critical, you need to bring the web assembly to the memory of Envoy. We need to share structure between the C++, I, I think, to actually the web assembly. So there's quite, quite an interesting work that should be done here, and this is exactly what we did. Uh, can you do next? Yeah, and, and the way we did it, right? I mean, oh, Google, Google actually did it. Uh, we help a little bit. It's basically by defining the interface, and the interface, is basically what's called ABI. So it's basically like API, but for binary. And that's basically most of the work that's being done in order to bring it to Envoy. So first of all, we need to bring it inside the memory of Envoy. This is the first thing. And then second of all, we need to make sure that it will um, honor the, 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 you know, the ABI. And, 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 and then it's fine. And as I said, uh, WebAssembly itself is basically going to run in a sandbox. This is why it's so secure. Maybe I didn't say that, so I will say it right now. It should be extremely support, and the way to actually do it is by running in, in, in VM, right? And specifically here, this is V8, the one we chose. Uh, and then the customer will be, need only to put the code that it's actually they care, what the business logic it itself. Now, ABI, as you can see, example in the right side, it's basically really like a C, C right? I mean, it's very low level code. And for that, next. <laughs> We will need to write some SDK for the customer because eventually, you know, if I'm trying to make it easier for you to actually write in whatever language you want, I need to make sure that it's not going to be very hard as writing C because then, you know, what, what is the big, or what did I do here, right? So specifically in order to do this and also make sure that the customer will not need to write those low level functioning, we need an SDK, right? And that's exactly what we did. So Google did the C++ one, we did the, web, the assembly script one, uh, together we did the Rust one, the community is working on, on Tiny Go right now. And the idea is basically let's create those SDK that will make it extremely simple for people to write this code that should go inside the WASM, including with the, the basically VM. And this is basically what we did. Now, yeah. Um, so when we looked at this, right, and when I thought, look at it as the first time, I said to myself, this is brilliant, right? <laughs> this is like going to change everything that we do, right? But here's the thing. There is a lot of similarity for something that already happened in this ecosystem. And this is what Docker basically did. So if you think about it, what we just did right now, what mainly Google, uh, Google did right now, they created something that is a very low level. It's brilliant, but it's actually really, really hard. You still have to do a lot of work. It's really, really complex, right? You need to bring it to memory. You need to write those SDK. It's basically mapping of, it's really, really complex things to do. So in order to kind of like make it simple to do, it's kind of like make me understand that there is a lot of familiarity for what, what already happened in this ecosystem. And as you remember, Linux container was actually created by Google as well. But Docker is the one that took this complex uh, concept and make it extremely easy to use for, for us all to consume it. So I saw this, specifically Solomon Hike, the founder of Docker, wrote in 2019 that basically he, he got so excited about WASI and WASM and he said, this is this is like if these things was exist in 2008, I will never need it to build uh, Docker, and this is true. I mean, in my opinion, Wasm is is the Wasm, which is WebAssembly, is the most important thing that happening in the cloud native ecosystem, and I think it's not going to be only for the for the proxy. It's going going to infect all of us in the cloud native. This is the future. So now, Christian, next. So that's what bring me to basically build the Docker like experience for everything that we done with Wasm. So what is this? It's very simple. It's basically a command line. It's called WASMI. And what WASMI is doing is very simple. It's giving you one command line, and Christian will show you soon, that you will be able to initialize your environment. And basically, he's doing all the hard work for you, <laughs> right? And then when you, and again, Christian will show you a demo, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But basically, you will be able to then easily build, put the, the, the business logic, build it, push it, to a registry, we created WebAssembly Hub. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a free project. Just go, go ahead and push your code there. And then basically you can pull it if you want to your system 
or more interesting than this, you can deploy it on whatever system you want. So right now it's supporting Glue, of course, because this is what written as well we actually integrated seamlessly with uh, STO and we worked very close with the with the with the STO team and Google actually announced it with us together as basically the official way to extend STO. Uh, so this is kind of like what it is. WASMI is an open source project. WebAssembly Hub is a project out there, you know, kind of like an offer. Everybody can use it. It's free. It's not costing anything. You can log in, you can use, you know, you can leverage a lot of uh, of uh, of uh, of WASM uh, filter that already was pushing there. And again, right now it's focusing on Hanvil, but it doesn't have to, right? There is way more we can do in the cloud and this is where I wanna take it next. So I will wrap it up and basically ask Christian to show you a demo. Yep, it is time for a demo. Um, I'm gonna leave this up here just for two seconds just in case I don't get to it at the end, but WebAssemblyHub.io is the location for WebAssembly Hub, and you can go to that right now. Service Mesh Hub is a open source project. We will be starting community meetings tomorrow and uh, also invite you to join the community, join uh, uh, slack.solo.io. And we are growing feverishly and hiring, so please reach out to us if you're interested in working on these types of technologies. So let's go to the WebAssembly Hub. Let's go to a cluster that is ready. Let's make sure. Perfect. All right. So what we're going to do, this is a little bit lower level uh, demo, although it is similarly scripted. What we're going to see here is we have Istio running in our cluster. And again, we have a, the Istio book info demo running here. If we make a call between the product page and the details page, we can see, well, we get a response. Uh, we've done it verbosely, so we can see the headers and the return headers and so forth. What we're gonna do is we're gonna write a very quick, because we're running out of time, WebAssembly module that um, basically gets injected into Envoy and can manipulate the response headers. And so to do that, we're gonna use a tool called WASMI. WASMI is a CLI that comes along with the WebAssembly Hub that allows you to very quickly bootstrap WebAssembly projects for, for Envoy. So we're going to do WASMI init. We're going to pick uh, assembly script as the language that we want to write in. We're going to target Istio 1.5 in this case. So what that is going to do is extra or build our project for us creating all of the correct dependencies and uh, even uh, uh, bootstrap a, an initial, um, initial code to, to help you get started here. Now, if we take a look, uh, um, the, this, this demo is actually recorded on our, our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so I might end up going a little bit quicker than, than ideal, but uh, you can go back and watch it there. The, the ABIs that we're targeting that the idiot mentioned are, are declared in our dependency configuration. If we look at the source code specifically um, and come to the on response headers function, we can see that we're, you know, if there's, if there's configuration, then let's, let's use that as the response uh, header for, for hello. We're going to add a header called hello. And if there's no configuration, then we'll just uh, assign hello header to, to world and we can I'll show you how we pass in this configuration at at runtime so that that is fine what we want to do here is build our project so we're going to do WASMI build so we don't have to uh, whether it's C++ or Go or assembly script or any of this stuff um, we can very quickly build the WebAssembly module package it with the spec that we you know that, that's been defined for these types of modules package it as an OCI uh, image and then tag it with a correct name. In this case, we're calling it demo add header. And then actually now if we list locally, we should see that V06 is here that I just built it. I built one earlier today uh, just to make sure the demo works, but we built it here. And then now what we want to do is push it to the WebAssembly Hub registry. So if you go to WebAssemblyHub.io, that's where you'll see this registry. Uh, we come here, WASM Hub, WebAssemblyHub.io. We can see that we can discover 
any of the existing, if we go to uh, explore, we can see various projects that other, other folks have been um, building their own WebAssembly modules and you can uh, search for them. The one that I just built should be here, demo add headers. We can see the different WebAssembly modules that I pushed. The, I didn't add an overview, overview but the tags that I, uh, that I created v0.6, we can see 33 seconds ago was, was pushed to WebAssembly Hub. Now that we have our module built, we need to, you know, we can go to the, the hub to discover it, but then we want to install it and actually use it. So in this part of the demo, part two, what we're going to do is deploy that WebAssembly module that we created into our Istio deployment. So again, when calling between product page and details, we see the, the response headers doesn't include hello, whatever, right? We didn't, we didn't add that WebAssembly module yet. But to do that, we're going to do WASMI deploy. So we don't have to know any of the details of uh, Istio and loading WebAssembly modules and so forth. We just do WASMI deploy into Istio. The specific, uh, oh, it looks like I didn't update that part of the script. So we'll, up to, we'll deploy a old, little slightly older version, but it should work the same. And we see that the WebAssembly module then gets deployed into our Istio workloads, at least the ones we specified. In this case, we specified everything running in book info. We can also apply selectors and be more fine grain about how the, the WebAssembly module gets injected into these Istio workloads. And what we can see under the covers is we built the correct Istio configs to load the WebAssembly module. So if we just take a very quick look here, we can see that it's uh, the V8 runtime that we're loading this, this WebAssembly module right here. Um, the configuration we specified on the CLI earlier was to set it to tomorrow. So now if we make that call again, up and we see that the, it looks like the, the pods have been recycled to take up this uh, WebAssembly module. And that has actually been improved in a slightly older version here that's been improved so that the WebAssembly module now gets streamed directly into the workload, not uh, mounted in like, like we saw. But if we do this call again and cross our fingers, we should see that the WebAssembly module got loaded. And now we have a new header in here called hello with a value of tomorrow, which is what we can configured on the CLI. And lastly, I'll show you that we can also undeploy the, the, the module as well. Now, I apologize, we've come up against time, but we can start to take a look at uh, some, some of the questions. That, that yeah. and, and whatever we didn't, we will not manage to answer, please join our Slack and yes. we are there, me, Christian, and all the team will be able to answer any questions that you have. And again, sorry, we ran out of time. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for, uh, it was uh, definitely a lot of uh, territory that was covered, really compelling. Uh, 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 demos and presentation. Uh, we do have a couple. Betty also jumped on chat and mentioned you can uh, uh, edit, edit uh, Betty and I, I think Christian are all on CNCF Slack also, so you can always private message them uh, there. Uh, let me see if we can quickly run through a couple of these. Uh, I'm going to have a bias towards Alberto Torres, uh, who from uh, New York City Kubernetes meetup member uh, asked, what's the story or motivation I, I read into this between managing the WebAssembly assets? Uh, is it deploying to all Envoy proxies, rolling back, rollbacks, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. so basically, so basically the question, why should we use a WebAssembly? Like what kind of functionality we can do with it? Yeah, so it means, what's the story behind managing the assets themselves? I don't think it's uh, so much about what you can do with them, uh, rather uh, what I'm reading, and Alberto, feel free to clarify in chat, uh, it, it's uh, the, the motivation behind managing the assets themselves. So, I mean, the asset itself, the only reason we did it is just for simplicity. I mean, we have a lot of customer running in production, and they are very interesting in that functionality. And, it were, and we build it for them first. 
And then we just thought that all the community will be able to benefit from it. So this is why we did it. But it's way, you know, the, the ability, you know, there's, as I said, if I understand correctly, the question, it shouldn't be extremely uh, different than why do you manage the Docker container? I think that that's the question, but I'm not what I'm percent understanding. Okay. If anything, I'll Alberto, you yeah. can reach out. I'll yeah, connect. Reach out I'll, I'll, I'll okay. connect Betty uh, with you all and, uh, and and take it from there. And we have uh, one more question from Andras uh, Virag, uh, who says uh, who had inquired uh, about the Service Mesh Hub, uh, and he asked, "I'm interested in how the Service Mesh Hub control plane can be installed in an H in a highly available way that can survive cluster meltdowns." He had. Or, uh, Andras had earlier asked about uh, HADR scenarios for the service mesh. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's a that's a good question. So there's a couple levels there. One is for the service mesh hub management plane. You do ideally want that in a active passive uh, deployment, so that if the you know the, the the leading one or the active one goes down, that you have another one that come up right behind that, and you can run any number of, of passive uh, management planes for that. And then an, a, an important an, an important uh, part of the puzzle, though, is if the management plane goes down. Each individual service mesh and individual service mesh control plane still lives on and is still autonomous, right? So you can, none of, you're not affecting any of the uh, request path by the management plane going down. Um, so that's, that's a highly desirable state, <laughs> uh, but you can run the service mesh hub. The idea is to run service mesh hub as a active passive deployment. Okay. Cool. Uh, and we are, uh, okay, most of my questions were answered. The various was CLI commands. Is there a declarative way for rolling out WebAssembly modules like tied yes. to CI scenarios? Yes. So, I mean, specifically, we have two, uh, two um, a, a way to deploy uh, WebAssembly. WebAssembly, one of them is in Glue and one of them is in, 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 in an STL. In Glue, we basically did it seamlessly because we are owning it. In STO, we created an operator, and as Christian showing you right now, we actually wrote a blog on it. It's basically an operator that know how to take what the, the control plan and basically make it a declarative. So you can do all from YAML, and it's just going to go and apply that. So yeah, we're ready to carry it. <laughs> all right, awesome. And as uh, they showed earlier, there's a bunch of different ways you can get in contact with the team. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, again, the webinar recording and slides will be available later on in the day. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you so much, guys.